You've probably heard the expression, the clothes make the man. This is actually a paraphrase from a line in Shakespeare's Hamlet, a line that goes, for the apparel oft proclaims the man. And what exactly does that mean? Well, when Bill Shakespeare wrote this, he was living in a time and a place when clothes were an identifier of social status, an identifier of class. Clothes would show who a person was, their job, their rank, that sort of thing. It would also denote a person having gone through a special event in their lives. Think of a wedding dress or a funeral garb. Nowadays, clothes don't really do that so much. They're not used so much to identify a person's income level or anything like that. But, if you were to see two people on the street, one wearing a suit and tie and the other wearing shorts and a t-shirt, you would be more likely to guess that the man wearing the suit and tie is going to be a businessman. Or if you see a woman wearing a floor-length ball gown, you're going to assume that, that she is more likely to be headed to a fancy fundraiser event than would be the woman wearing a softball uniform. So in some ways, the clothes make the man. And there are other examples that I'm sure you could think of. Jobs, activities, sports, they all require different dress. What about this? What about a blaze orange jumpsuit? Or what about a simple cotton shirt pants combo that has black and white stripes all over it? In that case, you would say the clothes make the man a prisoner. This is how a prisoner could be identified. And when you see someone wearing those clothes, there's actually a lot that you can say about that person, a lot that you can tell about the person wearing them. You could say beyond a shadow of a doubt that that person has very few freedoms in life, that he is confined to a certain small area inside certain small walls. You would say that that person spends most of his time inside of a cell made up of concrete and iron bars. You could tell that that person has somebody in charge of them, someone telling them what to do, and that person is told when he must sleep, when he must work, and when he must eat. The clothes make the man. Those prison clothes show who the prisoner is. And in that case, in that situation, that prisoner is certainly dressed for the occasion of being a prisoner. Now, I've noticed that none of you here is wearing a blaze orange jumpsuit. None of you are dressed as prisoners. And you wouldn't want to be either. And you wouldn't voluntarily become a prisoner. But what if I take this idea and I put it into the spiritual context of Galatians? What if I shift from the earthly realm to the spiritual realm? If I do that, then there is an increased likelihood that we wear prison clothes. There is an increased danger of becoming a prisoner. So this is what was happening to those believers in those cities in Galatia. The, one, the ones to whom Paul was writing, the ones about whom we have learned over the past few weeks. They were in danger of becoming prisoners under the law. And therefore prisoners under all of the condemnations that the law requires. Now why would anyone want to do that? Why would anyone place themselves as prisoners under something? Well, as we heard a number of weeks ago, Paul mentions to them, they were being deceived. They were being bewitched. There were false teachers coming in and telling them that salvation is not found in Christ alone. But if they wanted to secure for themselves a place in heaven, they had to become prisoners. They had to place themselves under the control of someone else. Now, these false teachers weren't going to say it like that, but in these words from Galatians, we hear Paul telling them, that's exactly what is happening. So they could understand the danger that they were in. Listen again to what Paul writes. Before faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. The law was put in charge. And in that sense, it's almost as easy to spot the person who is held prisoner under the law as it is to spot the person who is a resident of the nearby state penitentiary. 
He doesn't wear a, a blaze orange jumpsuit. He doesn't wear black and white stripes. But what that prisoner wears is his sins. As a prisoner under the law, a person's sins are held to him. They cover him. They are all over him. And he must deal with them. A prisoner under the law is responsible for taking care of those sins so that those sins will not have a negative eternal effect. That's what the law says. The law tells a person that he or she must be just. If they want to be justified before God, then they have to be perfect. They have to be just. That means no sin, ever. That means never putting anything of a higher priority before God. It means never worshiping false gods. It means never misusing his name or missing an opportunity to worship. It means never disobeying those people in authority, God's representatives who are here on earth for our good. It means never hurting anyone, never committing adultery, never stealing, never lying, and never even thinking about doing those things or wanting to do them. The law that is in charge, has these regulations for us, and we must abide by them. But so often, the problem is that we find ourselves doing exactly those things that we are not supposed to do. So what happens then? Not only does the law tell us what to do, it also tells us what must be done if we fail to keep it. And so we are under that condemnation of the law. There are penalties for wearing those sins. Penalties for carrying them. But who of us can pay those penalties? Who of us can satisfy those laws? Who of us can say, I have been perfect? Certainly no one. Who of us could say, I haven't been perfect, but I've done enough to make up for those sins? We can't do that either. The law requires that we pay for these sins. And so we desperately and frantically find a way to pay for them. And maybe we think if we follow a certain ceremonial law or a certain ritual, then, then maybe we'll be okay. That's what was being told to those Galatians. Maybe if we make enough sacrifices in our life, we give up enough of our, our time or our wealth, then maybe we can even things out. That's what we say when the law, with its fear, hangs over us. Because living under the system of that law, and living as prisoners of that law, and wearing all of those sins, that's the only solution we can come up with. So we work, and we work, and we work, and the law tells us what we must do, and when we must do it. But in the end, no matter how much we give, it will never be enough, and the law will never be satisfied, and those penalties can never be paid. Not until we give our lives. That's the only thing that the law will be satisfied with. Eternal death, eternal condemnation. There is nothing that we can do in order to satisfy the law. And so if we try, then all we are doing is living as slaves under the law, prisoners of the law, and we are dressed for the occasion as our sins cover us. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. There is the rest of that verse that sheds so much light on the situation. Anyone who places himself as a prisoner under the law is dressed for that occasion and is doomed. Therefore, justification, being declared not guilty before God, it has to come from another source. This is where Christ comes in, who by his work, and by his grace, declares us to be not guilty. He takes the sin off of us, and it is by faith then, and not by observing the law, that we are justified. We are declared not guilty through faith in Christ. Because Christ has removed all of those sins. He has taken away every single wicked thought, word, and deed. They no longer are hanging on us. We no longer wear them. And so God has also, through Christ, removed the responsibility that we have to pay for those sins. Jesus Christ came and he paid the penalty for us on our behalf. That's what the law required and that's what Jesus gave. 
So now that belongs to us through faith. We have become perfect before God by faith. We have made the payment that's required because we belong to Christ through faith. And we are set free from the law because Jesus has removed that law from us. No longer can we be held prisoner under the law, prisoners with the responsibility because Jesus has removed that responsibility. No longer are we required to do what the law demands because Jesus did that for us and he declares that we are innocent of all guilt. That's what Jesus gives to us. He removes the clothes of sin that we wear that holds us as prisoners. And in place of that, he gives us a robe of righteousness. And he dresses us for an altogether different occasion. God does through baptism. We've sung about baptism already this morning and we will do so again because these words from Galatians remind us of what baptism does for us. Baptism connects us to Christ and to everything that he has done for us. Baptism washes away those sins. Baptism makes us holy and righteous because it ties us to the the sacrifice that Jesus has made. Most importantly, baptism robes us with the righteousness that Jesus Christ has earned. Perfection that Jesus has won for us. That's what we wear. So as I said before, that means we're dressed for, for an entirely different occasion. No longer prisoners but instead dress for the glories of heaven. What we wear is perfection. Every year, celebrities in the movie and music industries gather together for what's known as a white party, and it is hosted by an R&B artist, Sean Combs. Of course, you know him as Puff Daddy. Every year, it's a, a highly honored event, and it is an honor to be invited to such an occasion. It's a big deal. And so if you are invited to that party, you would never even think of disgracing the host by wearing something that wasn't completely white. That's the rule. That's the dress code. That's how you are dressed for that occasion. It's not good enough to wear a a white shirt that has a thin colored stripe on the sleeve. It's not good enough to wear shoes that are completely white except for a black logo found somewhere on them. And as I said, you would never even think of doing that. Because your host has invited you to the party of the year, and you're going to honor him. Now what if you have been invited to a white party? And what if that party were held in heaven, and the host were none other than God himself? He would say to you, you must come dressed in all white. No colors, no stains, nothing of the sort. And you would honor him by doing that. But as you make your way to the party, suddenly you see someone whose life you consider to be so much better than yours and you desperately want to have that life. And all of a sudden, there is a green stain on your clothes, green with the envy that you have for someone else's life. And then, thoughts of doubt and worry and fear start to creep into your minds because you're afraid that if you don't have that life, then you don't have a life worth living or you won't have enough to survive, you won't have enough to get by. And then your clothes are stained yellow with the cowardice that pulls us away from God. And then when you see that person, he says something to you that you consider to be insensitive, rather than taking his words In the best possible way, you become angry. Rather than forgiving, you are filled with anger, and then your clothes are stained red with all of the anger that you see. And when you look at your clothes and you see how stained they are, you become so depressed, so sad, and that's the only emotion you want to feel, forgetting Christ, forgetting what he has done for you, assuming that there is no way to be connected to him. And then there is a blue, a deep blue that washes over you as you are filled with that sadness. And then you show up to the party and your clothes that were once white are stained blue and red and yellow and green and and are filled with the black and brown sludge that your sin carries. There is no way that you're going to get into that party 
until the host himself pulls out a brand new robe that is completely white. And not only does he give it to you, he actually places it on your shoulders for you. As a baptized child of God, that's yours. And other baptized children of God are walking into the party dressed in those same robes. That's what we have been given. That is our gift. How can that be? How can it be possible? Well, it's possible through Christ because of what he has done, because of his gift. He doesn't tell us that we must sit there and scrub that cloak until all of those stains come out because that's impossible. He doesn't tell us that we must pay something in order to buy a new robe because we would never have enough to pay. No, he gives us what we need to be dressed for that occasion, to enjoy eternal life with him in heaven. So again, the clothes make the man. The clothes make us God's children, make us holy and righteous. They identify us as citizens of heaven where we enjoy eternal life forever. We are dressed for the occasion, not carrying any sin, not held as prisoners under the law, but free in Christ. Free to enjoy the riches of heaven. That's because of the clothes that we wear. Dressed for the occasion by the grace of God. Praise be to God that this is all ours. And that through him, we have eternal life waiting for us forever. Amen.